Would you guys, I thought maybe the whole idea of us being together is it's like a big family dinner, right? So when else do you get to ask Laura Nyrider questions? So if you're interested in asking some questions with the understanding that there is attorney-client privilege, um, I'm sure Laura would be able to, to field some of them. So anyone? Are you going to have to retry it? Am I going to have to retry it? Or is somebody, it? somebody going to have to retry it? Well, um, when the federal court granted our petition for a writ of habeas corpus, it gave the state of Wisconsin three options, basically. It gave the state, it said, state, you could release him right now. You could initiate a retrial, in which case you have 90 days to begin those proceedings. Or you could appeal the present ruling. Last Friday, we learned that the state has chosen to appeal, which means that the other two options, release or retrial, are put on hold until the appeal is resolved. That 90-day clock is no longer ticking. And I don't believe any amount of Hollywood editing could change the conclusion that, that we probably only saw the tip of the iceberg of how bad that was. But there is a lingering feeling by those of us in the audience watching that maybe he's the hapless, low-functioning dupe of the real murderer, which, who also right now claims he's not the real murderer. And the conflict is what I asking you about the distance you have to have between teams well i'll answer that question by saying this which is we get lots of questions all the time about stephen's case stephen is brendan's uncle he is his co-defendant those are questions that i don't answer <coughs> because i'm brendan's lawyer i'm not stephen's lawyer so we have adopted a policy of not publicly commenting on stephen's case well said <laughs> um it seems to me it's kind of follows just common sense or logic that somebody promises you a prize for saying a certain thing, you're kind of conjures up back when I was 17, I was pulled over on a motorcycle and the officer said, tell you what, you just admit to me that you were, that was you that was doing 120 on the bikes, back on Elm Boulevard, I'll just let you go. And he went, and ran my license, came back and he said, was that you or not? I said, no, that wasn't me. They said, if you admit it, I'll let you go. And he said, okay, it was me. They came back and right, said, you're doing 120 on the motorcycle. Turns out it really was me, but my point is. <laughs> <laughs> but even if it had not been me, I'm going to say yes if they promised me. So my question is, is there a law, or should, can't there be a law against making false promises just to extract a, a contrived confession that on paper is meaningless, on paper it's written on, if you promised them fame and fortune and vacations in Hawaii instead of going to prison? I mean, shouldn't there be... Yeah, that should be against the rules of interrogation. Yes. So uh, there are rules out there that have been out there for a very long time that purport to govern the way interrogations happen. And uh, one of the rules that courts are uh, in the business of applying does uh, say you can't overtly promise leniency during an interrogation in order to extract a confession. Courts all around the country have bent over backwards to interpret that rule in the most, most toothless possible manner. Because once you have a confession, especially in a murder case, maybe not in a parking ticket, in a speeding ticket right. case, although you were going pretty fast. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you know, especially in a murder case, once you've got a murder confession, the court is going to bend over backwards to let that thing into evidence. And you, so you have cases. I mean, I had a case out in Virginia that I was working on. It's an 18 year old kid, same thing, videotaped interrogation. And they said to him, You are going to get the ultimate punishment. This is Virginia, folks, right? The ultimate punishment, what does that mean? That means the death penalty, unless you confess. Also, it's supposed to be a big, big no-no. The court had no problem with it, because that confession sounded real, it sounded plausible, it sounded convincing, because he was regurgitating the facts that were told to him during the interrogation. Um, so these, there are rules, but uh, sadly, they don't have a lot of effect. Did they read the rights of they did read him his rights. Well, yes, they picked him up from his high school. Uh, the, the morning that he ultimately confessed, they picked him up from his high school. They read him his rights there at the curb on the outside of his high school, put him in the police car, drove him for 45 minutes to the, to the police station. During that 45 minute drive, they're talking to him about girls, they're talking to him about school and the weather and homework and sports. He has no idea, you know, you just read me these rights, but we're just having a chat. Then by the time he gets to the police station, there's no subsequent additional Mirandizing. And those rights that they told him about were long, long forgotten. 
because all of a sudden there's people in your face accusing you of terrible things. And you're not thinking about that conversation you had 45 minutes ago when you had no need of those rights. Um, so, yes, they did uh, Mirandize him, but in a, a different way than I would have liked. So where do those rules on interrogation exist? Are they police policy? Are they model policies? Are they statute? Are they case law? They're in case law. They are in case law. They derive from the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment. There, there is um, U.S. Supreme Court case law and then subsequent state and federal case law interpreting it. So this rule against promises varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. There are slight twists and turns on it. Um, there are also police <coughs> manuals. Nearly every police department in the country has its own manual, and usually there are organizations that are retained by state level police agencies to create model policies that implement that are supposed to implement the legal rules that police must follow during interrogations. And that's a, that's actually another project that my organization is working on, is working with those organizations that write police training manuals to change those manuals so that folks become more aware of the hazard of false confessions, what you need to do to avoid them. Because you know what we want to do here is help the police do their job better and more accurately. And I think everybody has an interest in that. So my question is, In a confession case, I think that um, what's interesting is there are several cases of exonerations, again, proven false confessions, confessions that have been proven false post-conviction by DNA, um, in which kids, especially, once they confess to the police, they sort of think, well, this is my story now. I have to stick with, with it. And they may not understand the difference, at least initially, between their lawyer and that prosecutor or that police officer who was just in that room talking to them. It might be just sort of another authority figure in a suit, and I gotta stick with this story that I was just told I had to say. So we've actually seen several cases in which false confessors stick with their stories at first, even with their defense attorneys, especially when it comes to kids. Um, how do you get around that? I think there are several ideas. I mean, I you know, all of us I'm sure engage in that kind of rapport building with one's client. You know, again, walking with our shoes with them. Mm -hmm. And with kids especially that that just takes time. Um, but there are other ways to analyze a confession. If you have, Minnesota records, of course, one of the first states to record its interrogations. So if you have transcripts of an interrogation, it's crucial, and you think this might be a false confession, it's absolutely crucial to go through the, the facts in that confession, every piece of evidence that ended up in that final confession, every piece of information, and go back and check. A, is it correct? You know, is this person accurately describing what happened? And B, if it is accurate, where did they get that information from? Could it have been anywhere else other than their own memory? Was it fed to them during the interrogation by the officer? Could they have read about it on the news, which sometimes happens? Could they have heard about it from their friends or their classmates at school? And you go through all of those pieces of information in the final confession, bit by bit by bit, and you can explain away every one, that's when you have a red flag. In uh, Brendan Dassey's case, did you have a complete from beginning to end video? We did. Yeah. We did. So you were fortunate in that regard because a lot of states don't do that. Exactly. And right. you're left maybe with just a tight transcript of the confession. That's right. And then that's a different ballgame. It's a different ballgame. What we do in those states, and you're right, about 20 jurisdictions right now uh, mandate that interrogations be electronically recorded. So the majority of states still don't. Minnesota's one of the first in state versus scales. But even that is audio recording, not video. So interesting. Now is and it video is in this day time online? not to do that where everybody's got So what song. you're getting are audio. So if you're getting an audio, you're not getting the body language, of you're course. not getting yeah, all of, of the stuff. you know, how how far from the witness's nose or the subject's nose is the police right. officer's nose. Right, right, of course. So I, Fascinating. Well in the jurisdiction, so you're you've got audio, you don't have video. Um, but in the jurisdictions that don't have either, what we do in those jurisdictions, it's actually sort of interesting. You've just got, let's say, a typed final confession or handwritten signed confession or something like that. What we do there is, again, we do this detail by detail analysis of the final confession, who, what, where, when, why, right. every single detail. And we go back and we try to trace, A, we ask A first, is this correct? Did this actually happen? And then for every fact that's correct, you can go back and look at the police investigation and say, is this suspect's confession mapping on to what the police already knew? 
did they provide anything new to the police that the police didn't already believe? And sometimes what you see is a confession that is detail for detail, maps exactly onto what the police already knew, and no more, no less. And that's when you start to be able to argue inferences then that this confession was fed you know, off camera. So a couple couple things. One, you know, I've read a, I watched the series and I've read a lot, and I'm I'm kind of wondering, did my understanding from some things I read, but I don't know if it's true, is that they actually talked to him a couple of days earlier too. The cops did, and might have said some stuff off the record that wasn't on the confession, which you know, of course, they beat him into it afterwards, basically. Um, but so I'm wondering about that, if that's true. Number two, I'm wondering, um, uh, my understanding is his mom said she wanted to come in and they wouldn't let her. So what do you, I mean, I, I'm sure there was some testimony about that in the, in the um, subsequent hearing, so I'm wondering if you can talk about that. And then thirdly, is there a movement afoot to not let minors, they shouldn't be able to talk to somebody when they yes. don't have a parent? Yes, so lawyer, lawyer. <laughs> right. um, yes. Those are my three. Yes, I'm okay, I'm I mean, three you remember them all. <laughs> um, Okay, first question is about, was he questioned more than just the one time? And you're, you, yes, you're exactly right. He was actually questioned four times over the course of a 48-hour period. And the interrogation that we saw in Making a Murderer, where he's sitting on that couch with a kind of peach-colored wall behind him, was the fourth yeah. of, those, of those occasions. The first two times were two days earlier. The police officers showed up at his school. They had not informed his mother, to get to your second question. They arrived at his school. Uh, they pulled him out of his, actually it was lunchtime, so pulled him out of the cafeteria, brought him to the principal's office, and they questioned him there in the principal's office. The principal was not present, so it was just the two officers and Brendan. And they audio taped this. It was just an audio recording on the table. There was no video there. And that's where they first began to plant uh, the notion that you were at Stephen Avery's fire, you saw bones and body parts. It's actually fascinating. They sort of say, well, you were at that fire. Didn't you see anything? Didn't you see anything? No, 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 no. And they say to him, well, Brendan, you must have seen something. We're not going to believe you if you don't say you saw something. And you must have seen a hand, a foot, a head, something. This goes on and on and on. And eventually, Brendan parrots back to them. Well, I guess I saw fingers, toes, and a forehead, the same body parts that they just listed to him. So that's, you know, and then they sort of press him and press him, and they say, well, if you saw these fingers and toes and a forehead in the fire, you must have asked your uncle, what is this? What am I seeing? And he says to them, and he must have told you, Brendan, that this is a woman he raped. Isn't that what he told you? And on and on and on and on and on, and eventually he says, yes, yes, I did ask my uncle, and yes, he said this was a woman that he raped. So that's what happens at high school with the audio tape only. Then they immediately take him to a nearby police department not the one that's 45 minutes away. Mom still has no idea. They get out the video camera that time and have him repeat the statement on video. Then uh, there's a third statement late that night around 10 or 11 p.m. I don't know the exact time because it was not recorded at all. No video, no audio. That took place at a nearby hotel. The next day, nothing. February 28th, nothing. Then March 1st, they come back to school. This time they did contact his mother and ask her permission to question him again. Uh, and she granted her permission to, to question him again. They did not tell her that he was a suspect in this murder case, so she did not understand the context of the questioning. She also, as they knew, was going to be in court on divorce proceedings that day, and completely tied up, um, which I think is why they waited that, that day, um, instead of just coming back to him the following day. So she was in divorce proceedings when they came back to his high school, they picked him up, they drive him that 45 minute drive to the Manitowoc police station, and they interrogate him. At some point during that interrogation, she arrives. We know that because when they're done, they let her back into the room. They let her into the room. Um, but of course, you know, she was not allowed in the room until after he confessed. Which then brings uh, your third point, which is, can we change the law so that it's illegal to question children without their parents present? And I would take that a step farther. I would take that a step farther, and I say that as a parent who would want to be there with my children. But what kids need, in addition to parents, is the counsel of an attorney before they are interrogated. A meaningful opportunity to consult with an attorney before they are interrogated. This is vital. I mean, think about Brendan, for those of you who have seen Making a Murderer. This is a kid who did not understand what was at stake. He didn't understand it because the officers told him everything would be okay if he confessed. Then after he confesses to rape and murder, he thinks he's going back to school to finish his project. A lawyer in that room or before.
before they began to question him, would have been able to convey to him what was at stake and make his decision to waive his Miranda rights, his decision to speak with the police, a meaningful decision. And I'm very happy to say that several states have um, introduced bills in their various state assemblies along these lines in the wake of making murder. Illinois actually just passed the bill and the governor signed it, requiring counsel in the interrogation room a meaningful opportunity to consult with counsel before being interrogated for kids 14 and under. So it wouldn't have covered Brendan, but that's not bad. That's not bad, it's a great start. And there's other states that are considering it too. What's the role of the prosecutor in these cases where you believe the statements may be false? Well, we had a case just um, last year out of southern Illinois, East St. Louis, Illinois, which is right over the Illinois border from St. Louis, Missouri, in which uh, it was a videotaped interrogation like Brendan's. It's a 17-year-old. They brought him in. They accused him of armed robbery. Horrible. The kid just dissolves in tears. He has it on the floor in the fetal position, praying to God for his mom out. Please send me mama, he has intellectual disabilities. He operates about at the level of an eight to 10 year old. Please send me mama. And they end up coercing a confession out of him. Um, and he had to sit in jail nine and a half months, but the prosecutor on the case, to her immense credit, watched that videotape. I don't think that actually happens very much. I don't think folks actually watch those videotapes very much. And you're right, when you have the video, you see the tears, you see the anguish. You see the coercion in a way that cannot be communicated in any other way. Five officers with guns standing, standing out, outside. Exactly no right. Else. Exactly right. And uh, to her immense credit, she watched that and she dropped her. That's a rare outcome. Um, but I can only hope that as the problem of false confessions becomes more high profile, making murder is a huge boost for that. I'm grateful to the filmmakers for that people are going to start to become aware of the problem and are going to be asking the right questions. How can we detect these things? How can we prevent these things? Um, so I hope for the future. Thank you, Laura. Thanks so much. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, many of you are board members. You can just raise your hands. Others of you look around the, are um, volunteers and continual interns that we never let go at the back. Uh, and then all of the supporters that are here, the donors that are here, the people who put in countless hours, our videographer who has spent the last 16 hours with me, taking every piece of everything we've got going on. Grueling, grueling 16 hours. Yeah, I, 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 I,